We continue our book uh, series on the book of Romans with service, righteousness, demonstrated. I'll be covering quite a wide uh, swath from Romans 12 all the way to the start of Romans 15. So, as always, shall we commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you because you left for us the words of advice from your minister, from your servant Paul, so that we can read it today. We can think about what he said, think about what you taught through him. And even on this morning, I pray that I may speak only as your servant. Your Holy Spirit, you guide me to speak the things you want to be heard by your church. So commit this time to your hands. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Now I'm going to be covering, splitting this into three sections. The first being the, on the passage itself. Secondly, on the purpose uh, of Paul writing these, the, these chapters. And the third one, on the practical tips. The application to our lives. Now, before we go, uh, we're going to start with pas- the passage, and these three chapters, uh, three plus chapters, are about holiness and service. There are a lot of other things as well, but I'll be focusing on these aspects. So, before we dive into Romans 12 onwards, this is what has been covered previously. Uh, this is important because in Romans chapters uh, one to eight, the basic outline is that. God has provided for the whole world. We don't have to work for it through the following the Torah, the laws of Moses, which nobody can hope to fulfill perfectly. We will all fall short. But thank God that Jesus Christ has fulfilled it on our behalf. And all we have to do is accept this by faith. In chapters 9 to 11, Paul focuses on how that the Gentiles have been grafted into God's promises which were originally for only the Jews. And it's with this backdrop that Paul begins in verse 12, I appeal to you, therefore. Therefore what? Because of all the previous things he just mentioned about God's plan of salvation. God offering up uh, salvation to even the Gentiles by, uh, by faith in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Because of all these promises, therefore I appeal to you to present your lives, your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, and so on. So Paul is saying, you see what wonderful things God has given, has offered to you. In response, give your lives to be holy. Do not uh, not despise what God has given you. Do not despise the sacrifice Jesus made for all of us. And so, be transformed. do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So Paul starts off by encouraging the reader, because Christ has given you, made you part of this, uh, made you part of the olive tree, made you part of the family. Respond in holiness. Make yourselves conform to Him. And this section is about the service gifts, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. So, prophecy, service, teaching, exhortation, contributing, uh, leading, acts of mercy. Now, these are all different uh, aspects of service in the church. And I won't cover too uh, long on it because we have a lot to go. And these gifts of service will be covered at a later date in this time of year, uh, in this year. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Again, be holy, reject what is evil, choose what is good. Serve the Lord, contribute to the needs of the saints, bless those who persecute you, rejoice with those who weep. So again, uphold the body of Christ. Live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty. Associate with the lowly, never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one with evil, but give thought to what is honourable. Live peaceably with all. So again, be holy, be better people, show good. Now in Romans 13, the main focus is on the ruling authorities. And this is very pertinent to Paul's time and to many believers around the world today. Because the Romans are still the bosses. Jesus didn't come in uh, AD 30 to overthrow the Romans, overthrow all the kingdoms of the world physically. So Paul here is exhorting believers to not to rebel against the, the rulers, not to uh, be disobedient to break the laws just because they are pagans. 
They follow a different Lord. They follow different gods. But rather, be patient. Let yourself be subject to them. And this is what the Christians did. Rather than uh, rise up in rebellion, in taking up arms, forming an army, or if it existed in that time, suicide bombing, capturing people to cut off their head, hold them for ransom. Instead, Christians died for the name of Jesus Christ. And it's because of their witness, their martyrdom, that the name of Christ spread so greatly. But this whole section, I will not cover on it so much. So, love one another. The one who loves has fulfilled the law. And this also overlaps with service. Because how do you show love? The real way to show love is practically. Not just to say, I love you, but to show it, to do it for the person. Love does no wrong to a neighbour. Love is the fulfilling of the law. And Paul has been going on and on about, on and on about fulfilling the law of Moses is impossible for people. Instead, we fulfil the law of love, the law of faith, faith in Jesus Christ. And what does Jesus say? The greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God, to love one another. Let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armour of light. Walk properly, not in orgies, drunkenness, sexual immorality, sensuality, quarrelling, jealousy. Again, reject all the bad things and put on Jesus Christ. Don't gratify the desires of the flesh. And this is what I'll be focusing on in a while. For the one who is weak in faith, welcome him not to quarrel over opinions. Uh, this section is about those believers all have different opinions. When we become Christians, God doesn't erase our mind and put in a new program, turn us into robots. We all have different opinions. Some will say, oh, uh, is it alright to visit a temple along with family? Others will say, no, it's not alright. You're giving allegiance to false gods. Others will think, shall we uh, abstain from meat? Or there are even some today who say, we should follow the kosher laws just like the Israelites. And others will say, no, because Jesus made everything clean. So there will be arguments, there will be disagreements, but we shouldn't be quarrelling over this. Rather, we should uphold one another in love and each one be subject to their own conscience as they stand before God. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. And this is important to remember because we don't live for ourselves anymore. We are dead to sin, as Paul said earlier. Each of us will give an account of himself to God. So as I said, you don't have to, in the end, you don't answer to any other person. In the end, ultimately, you answer to God. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And this is the difference between uh, fulfilling the works of the law, the code of Moses, the holiness laws, the ritual laws. And if anybody doesn't fulfill everything perfectly, he's condemned. He cannot either fulfill the moral law because we are all sinful. But what is the law of faith? What is the faith in Jesus Christ? We have followed righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Instead of following all the many, many minutia laws, you cannot carry a mat, this and that, the Pharisees put in place. The real law is to love one another and to reject what is evil. And so on, continuing on about different types of food. And the last section that I'm supposed to cover, Romans 15. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. That through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And this is what I'll be focusing on. Because our lives are not easy. We have much better lives, we have much more comfortable lives than many other believers in other countries. Throughout history, especially when Christians were persecuted. So, but... To live lives that are holy, to reject what is evil, it's not easy. But we have endurance and we have encouragement. And so this is a prayer that the God of endurance and encouragement grant us to live in harmony. So this is a very quick overview of three plus very long chapters. The gist of it, be holy and serve in holiness. Now, why did Paul bring up these things. It's important in the Christian life because Paul wants us to be useful vessels. And this is, uh, you can say, in the middle of Romans, the 
okay, what many people take as the key text. In Romans 9, we read Paul writing to the honest saying, Has not the potter power over the clay to make of the same lump one vessel unto honour, and another to dishonour? And many people read this and say, Oh, so Paul is saying God has made us, God is the potter, He's made us like vessels, we have no say in the matter. They take a fatalistic outlook. Whatever happens, happens. Ah. We have no control over it. If I, my life is terrible, that's what God wanted for it. If I'm a bad person, oh, God made me this way. If I don't go to church, well, why God? It must be God never uh, prompted me by the Holy Spirit to go to church. In a way, they blame God. And we have our cousins who have really focused a lot on this fatalistic aspect. They call it takdir. It's fate, basically. It's what Allah wanted. There's no changing it. You just have to accept it. But when Paul uses the analogy of the vessels and the clay and the potter, what is he referring to? Jeremiah was called to go to the potter's house to see something that would be a sermon illustration. And as the potter was shaping the pot, the clay became mild in his hands. Now note, the potter didn't misshape the clay. The clay became mild. And then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does? Like the clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand. So Israel is the clay in the potter's hand. So far, so good. He continues on, If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, and if that nation I want repents of its evil, then I will repent and not inflict on it the disaster I planned. What did God just say? Yes, he may have planned evil on a city, on a country such as Nineveh in Jonah's time. But if they relent, so will God. It's conditional. God is saying, I've said that I'm going to destroy you guys. I say I've made you vessels of destruction. But if you repent and change your ways, I will change my plans for you. Opposite applies. If I announce a kingdom to be built up and planted, such as Israel, but they do not obey me and they do evil, I will reconsider the good I intended to do for it. And this is a very important uh, aspect of it. Yes, nations, individuals are pots, vessels in the potter's hands. We are all in God's hands, but we don't sink into fatalism. God is not the sort who sets everything out, who programs us like robots and expects us to follow automatically. He made us to be his images. He made us to be his children, his family. He wants us to give feedback. He wants real people. It's not a God of fate, a God of I'm not listening to whatever you say like Takdir. Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, he sends a message to Israel. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? And this is in this Paul's plea in Romans his fellow countrymen who had rejected Jesus and Messiah. Turn, why will you die? In fact, Paul uses the same analogy elsewhere when he writes a letter to Timothy that in the great house there are vessels of, for honour and vessels for dishonour. The same analogy he used in Romans 9. If anyone cleanses himself from the latter, from dishonour, he will be a vessel for honour, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. And that's the that's the why he uses the energy of vessels. It's not to say that oh we are pots and pans and uh, tongs. We have no mind. After all, it's inanimate object, right? If I take the pot upstairs and drop it on the floor, it's not going to cry in pain. It's not going to say why have you treated me like this? But Paul rather is using the energy of vessels because they serve a purpose in the master's household for every good work. When we hear Paul use energy of vessels, you're not supposed to think of this. God, do whatever you want with me. I have no say. I have no action. My brother, like Beauty and the Beast, the vessels are alive. They can respond. Paul 
was a chosen vessel. This is the same word used in, as in Romans 9. It's a vessel to do what? To carry God's name to the Gentiles, to kings, and even the children of Israel. What do we use a pot for? To carry water, to carry soup, to carry drink. What did God use Paul for? To carry the message of the gospel. And you find in the Bible, they like to use this in poetry, they are the parallel. So in Isaiah 44, you look at the words in blue. But here now, O Jacob, Israel. Jacob is Israel, remember? Jacob had his name changed to Israel when he wrestled with God. So is Jacob is Israel. And therefore, servant is the one God has chosen. So Jacob, was cho Jacob is God's servant. Israel is the one he has chosen. We are chosen to be his servants. For the sake of my servant is Jacob, Israel my chosen. Again, Israel Jacob, servant chosen. From these usages, it's quite clear. Why are we chosen? To be servants, to serve the Lord, to carry out his purposes, to be vessels of honour or dishonour in a great house. And this relates to the ever thorny problem that James says, what's the, good, what's the use of having faith without works? Faith by itself without works is dead. And some will say, oh, this shows that we have to do good works. We have, still have to fulfill certain laws. We still have to earn our place by credits. But it's a parallel to what Jesus said. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. A tree is known by its fruit. So we compare faith to the good tree and works to fruits. Faith is the tree and work is the fruit. Because when you go out to a field, how do you tell what kind of tree this is? You can't. It just looks like a pile of wood. How do you know what kind of tree it is? By its fruit. There we go, apple tree. How do you know what kind of person what heart the person has. Only God can know somebody's heart. I can't look inside your heart and know, oh, do you really love Jesus? Are you really converted? Do you really, are you really a follower of Christ? I can't mind with you. So, James, Jesus, how do we tell somebody is really a follower of you? You see the fruit. You see the deeds. Because from the outflow from the heart is what you see they do. Without, uh, if the tree in summer may continues to be just dead branches, no fruit, no leaves, what can you say? The tree is dead because you cannot see any fruit. And if you see somebody who says he's a Christian but he practices no gifts of holiness, no gifts of the Spirit, no fruit, can, you, can he really say that he's a living Christian? He really has faith in God. And just like in uh, Romans chapter 11, Jesus also used the energy of trees, branches, fruits, bearing fruit. The branches that are in him that do not bear fruit, he takes away. And those which bear fruit, he prunes to be more fruitful. And he focuses on this, the pruning aspect, which I'll return to in a short while. But if anyone does not remain in Jesus, he is thrown away and burned because he's useless. He can't bear fruit. You break a bunch off the apple tree, it's not going to bear fruit. It has to be connected to the tree and living. Just as Paul said, the bunches were broken off. The bunches of Israel were broken off so that we, the Gentiles, can be grafted in. Well, yes, because of their unbelief. What did Jesus say? Whoever does not remain in me is broken off. But, did they stumble so they should fall? Were they broken off because God hates them? God doesn't want the Jews anymore. God wants to damn all of them. No! God forbid it's through their false salvation comes to the Gentiles. Even in their sin and rebellion and they crucifying Jesus, God used it to bring out our good. And even if they don't continue in their unbelief, turn, turn from your ways. God will graft them back in. 
God will relent of the disaster He has planned for them. How we respond has a say in how God will use us, how God will treat us. We do not believe in a God of mindless fate, of everything automatic. Rather, we believe in a God who is a father, who listens to his children, who cares about them. God is not a dictator, as in certain religions. Now, Max Lucado, I'm, I'm sure you've heard this from anywhere, la, that God loves you just the way you are. When you were a sinner, Christ died for you. But he loves you too much to leave you that way. And this is the aspect of sanctification, to make you more like Jesus, more suitable to be a member of the family. The Lord disciplines those he loves. He chastens everyone who accepts his son. So you endure hardship as discipline. And that's why I said Jesus will prune those branches to bear even more fruit because this is what holiness is all about. He purifies those who follow him. He makes them even better. Sometimes you get a lump of clay that has impurities in it. Well, you can remove those impurities, remove those stones so that you can use the clay well. So he refines. Gold and silver is refined by fire, but God tests our hearts. How does God refine us? He has refined us in this furnace of affliction, suffering, tribulation. And when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. So you see this uh, analogy repeated many times. We are like silver, we are like gold, but to get silver and gold out of the ground, out of the mixture of impure metals, it has to be heated up greatly in the fire. In this way, rejoice because your faith is more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire. What does God want more than silver and gold and gems and rubies? Our faith. And if any man builds with gold and silver, again, in the end of days, it will be built with fire. So Paul is using the same energy because God will test the quality of each man's work. God will test us our faith. What have we done for the kingdom? How pure is our heart? And as I've always often said, I really think that when Jesus said to store ourselves up uh, treasures in heaven, the treasure is ourselves because we have an eternity of service to come and really what can we take to the next life? There's no point in taking gold because the streets are laid with gold. There's no point to bring phones and all these things because we have far better things to do when we're in God's presence. Rather, the only thing we can take is ourselves, our soul, our attitude, our character that has been refined over our lifetime. Now, you probably heard of this or seen it before. It's the red work illustration by Francis Chan. So I'll just take a short snippet. Imagine this rope. Okay, pretend this rope just goes on forever. Okay? Just imagination. Pretend it goes around the world a few times. It doesn't. It ends at the rock. But uh, let's just imagine this thing goes on forever. Now, imagine that this rope is a timeline of your existence. You just exist forever. You see this red part? This would represent your time on earth. You've got a few short years here on earth and then you've got all of eternity somewhere else. This is, this is your existence. And what blows me away is some of you, all you think about is this red part. It's all you think about. You're consumed with this. You go, oh man, I can't wait till here. You know, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to save, save, save so I can really enjoy this part right here. And you're consumed with that, and you're thinking, oh, man, am I going to get to travel? Am I going to eat well? Am I going to do this during this part? And I'm like, are you kidding me? What about this? What about this? What about, th- what about all this stuff? It's, just, it's crazy to me because the Bible teaches that what I do during this little red part determines how I'm going to exist for millions and millions and millions of years forever. 
And, and so why would I spend this little red part trying to make myself as comfortable as possible, enjoying myself as much as I can, Paul says, look, I'm going to live my life for this mission. I'm going to spend my life, invest my life for this moment when I cross that finish line. See, I'm going to forget about all this stuff I could enjoy, and I'm not going to look around. I'm going to be like a runner just looking at that moment when I face God because when I face him, then I don't get this chance over again. We get one chance at this life on earth, and it can end at any second for any of us. We've got one chance at this, and then comes eternity. One chance and then eternity. The red section at the end of the rope is our life on this earth. This is the time that God is using to purify us, purify our hearts to make us holy. Now, I think once we cross over and have those thousands and millions of years, we will still have time to develop. We will still have many things to learn. But why not save up and invest for that time now? If you're going to Let's say you're going to emigrate to the USA. You got your green card. Very good. But if you're going to emigrate there next year, are you just going to spend all your money now? You should be saving up some US dollars, right? So as Christians, we all have this green card to go to be with Jesus once we die. Are we saving up any heaven dollars, so to speak? Are we investing in the treasure to serve God? So there's a, one of the theodicies, one of the answers to the problem of evil is the soul-making one. And basically it says that why are we living through this life with all this sorrow and hardship? Why can't God, I believe in Jesus, take me home now? Like Paul said, right? He'd rather be with the Lord rather than and be absent in the body. So why? So this idea says that when we overcome difficulties in this life, when we learn from the experiences, God is molding us, God is forming our soul, God is preparing us, refining us for the eternity we're going to spend with Him. Now, this is often a question. Can you sin in heaven? Oh, surely not, right? Because there's nothing impure in the new heaven, new earth. But does that mean people still have free will? Because, correct, right, Paul, James, everyone said it's impossible for us not to sin. Anyone who says we have no sin is a liar, John said. So how can there be no sin in heaven but we are not robots? What, what's the point, honestly, of God letting us be humans here but once we die, become robots? Might as well be robots from the start, right? So I'll give this illustration that I gave very long ago about my own experience. Once I went and ate Chendol Pulut from a not so reputable shop. I got such bad food poisoning that I was, had to go to the ER. I couldn't drink anything. I was constantly on the toilet, either vomiting or purging, and even though nothing is coming out. With nothing in my system, I still tried to vomit because that's how bad the bacteria was. Now, after this horrible experience, do you think I will ever eat Chendol Pulut from an unreputable shop again? I'm not that stupid. If you freely offer me chendol pulut from some roadside stall that nobody knows, sitting next to a big smelly drain with flies everywhere, I will freely never choose to eat that. And that's kind of what I think is like in the soul making theodicy in our experience on this earth. It's been said before, once you've experienced how horrible the effects of sin are, when we wake up in our new life, we have the, the choice, the temptation, we will never give in to it because we remember perfectly how high the price was paid when we chose sin. And when we meet Jesus face to face, we probably even recognize how high the price He paid for our sins. And so, we can have free will because we have learned, like I did with Chandra Pulut, not to do the stupid things ever again. So, as with Chandra Pulut for me, so it will be with sin for everyone who's gone through this life and learned firsthand what it is to wrong God, the kind of outcome we, uh, can we reap from what we sow. So all these troubles, all these difficulties, is slight and momentary. Little bit of that red rope preparing us for an eternity. 
And so we rejoice in our sufferings because through these sufferings, it produces endurance. When you go through difficulties, little by little, every day a little bit, you start to become thick skin. You start to get used to it. And this endurance produces character. Then when you're faced with a similar situation but nobody's forcing you to do the right thing, you do the right thing because it's built in already. And this character produces hope. When things are really down, you trust that God will see you through. So J. Waller Wallace has a similar analogy to Francis Chan. In your life, on earth, yes, some years, maybe 70, 80 years, let's see Mati at 50, kaput. What a waste, right? Half your life was wasted, thrown away and gone. Even worse, the last 10 years of your life, 40 or 50, was spent in hospital. What kind of life is that? What a waste. But if you look at it, in the larger scheme of things. When you were young, you got vaccinated. How long did you cry? Can't remember, right? Compared to the many years of your life that be second. That is what it's like when you remember that our lives are eternal. However much suffering, purification, refining we go through in this life is nothing compared to the eternity to come. So it's the same energy, but the flip side. Francis Chan is saying, Use your life now for, to save up and prepare for eternity to come. And J. Wanos is saying, the suffering you encounter now is nothing compared to the eternal life to come. Two sides of the same coin. So, I come now to the practical part. Basically, you already know, it's been said many times, be holy as God is holy. Live in holiness and so on and so forth, righteousness, but it's not easy. So, here are some practical tips that I've learned from my own experience. The key point is, little by little, every day, Jesus is changing me. Not all at once. Not immediately. Although our conversion, our salvation can be said to be instantly because once you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, He has accepted you. But our sanctification is an ongoing process. We become more and more conform to the image of his son. Now this is predestined. Paul didn't say immediate. Paul didn't say instant. We all have to go through a process of becoming conformed to the image of his son and it is not easy. Now Paul and others often use this energy of running a race, of exercise, of sports, of athletics, of training. In the race, everyone runs. So a self and athlete exercises self-control in all things. So do not run aimlessly. Do not box as one beating the air. He disciplines his body to keep it under control, lest he be disqualified. So Paul is using the energy of a marathon runner, an athlete. And the author of Hebrews says, since we're surrounded by a great crowd of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. Let us run the endurance with endurance, the race that is set before us. You cast off everything. If you're going to run for a marathon, you're not going to keep, uh, you're not going to carry a heavy handphone, wear a bag with laptop and everything and start running, right? You throw off every unnecessary weight so you can run with endurance. And what are all these unnecessary weights? The sins which entangle us. And when Paul came to, towards the end of his life, he said, I finished, I fought the good fight. Again, boxing analogy. I finished the race, I've kept the faith, and he'll award me on the final day. So again, many times he use the energy of athletic sportsmanship, training, exercise, and I think there's a good reason for it because how many push-ups can you do? If I ask you to drop and push up, can you give me 100 right now? I can't do 100. Okay, how about tomorrow? Can you do 100 tomorrow? No. How do you get fit? Little by little, every day. You start with one, two, maybe five. After those ten, you want to die already. Next day, you cannot move your arms. You persevere at it. The next time you do ten again, after a while, you start to feel, oh, I can actually move my arms this time. From ten, you go to fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, and suddenly, not suddenly, lah. After a very long time, you can do a hundred. You're getting fit. 
That's what exercise is like. Now, this is a scene from Kung Fu Panda, if you still remember it long ago. Sifu want to send him through the training course. And it looks very difficult, so he asks, uh, Master, is there a level zero? There's no such thing as level zero. You go. After that, he feels so badly, there is now a level zero. You are it. You don't learn Kung Fu overnight. You don't become 100 push-ups guy, fit, overnight. It takes little by little, every day. Now, the oldies among you who have watched this original, the Karate Kid with Mr. Miyagi, and in the 2000s, they released a remake with Jackie Chan, teaching, uh, uh, teaching Jaden Smith, which is Will Smith's son, Kung Fu. But uh, they had to keep the name, keep the name for copyright or something lah. So, like I said, you don't learn kung fu overnight, and sometimes you go through a lot of hardship and even confusion. So I'll show you this short scene that demonstrates what I mean. It is a reimagining of the original scene. If you still remember, wax on, wax off, uh, clean up, clean down. Pick up your jacket. Oh. So basically, Mister Han. What I'm trying to say is, I got a good foundation here. You know, like I said, I'm just... Might not be as hard to teach me as other people, you know? Hand it up. Okay. All right, but now... Take it down. You just... Take it down. Put it on. Take it off. I already did Take all this. Take it off. Can you just tell me why I'm Take doing this? Take it off. Hand it up. Take it down. Put it in the ground. Pick it up. Hang up. Take it down. Put it on. Take it off. Put it on the ground. Pick it up. Hang it up. Take it down. Put it on. Take it off. Hang it up. Now, after many weeks of this nonsense, eventually. you i get it okay be respectful i got it i put my jacket on a thousand times i took it off a thousand times okay this is stupid i'm done they can beat me up if they want to and you know why you only have one student because you don't know kung fu so joy what come here Check it on. Mr. Han, I already... Check it on. Check it on. I don't have a jacket Check on. Check it on. Be strong. Check it on. Firm. Check it off. Remember, always strong. Check it off. Strong. Left foot back. Right feet back. Left foot back. Pick up your jacket. Focus. Okay. Always concentrate. Left back. Right foot back. Pick up your jacket. Stay! Pick up your jacket. Stop. Hang it up. 
Hang it up. Hang up. And edit you. Strike. Hang up and edit you. Harder. Harder. Good. But no face. When he started out, he's just a skinny kid. He can't do Kung Fu. But what did the Sifu tell him? Pick up your jacket. Put it, uh, hang it up. Take it down. Throw it on the ground. Put on your jacket. Take it off. Over and over and over again. The boy is thinking, this is nonsense. What's the point? I'm not learning anything. I wanted to learn Kung Fu. Sometimes God is, feels like that, isn't it? Our Sifu in the sky. God, why am I going through this? What is the point? I'm not learning anything. But sometimes God wants our obedience. There's something He's working out that we can't see. It might not be now. It might be long in the future. But that's what Paul is getting at, isn't it? When you start out, you can't straight away do Kung Fu. You probably hurt yourself. You don't have the strength for it. You don't have the muscles for it. When you start out, you can't do 100 push-ups. You have to do it little by little, every day. And I feel that this is why Paul compares, the writers in the New Testament compare our faith walk, our faith marathon to sports, to exercise. Whatever comes our way, God is using it to work together for our good. So fine, Paul and the writer and the Hebrew, writer of Hebrew compare our faith walk to exercise. Okay, little by little, every day, how do you practice your heart? How do you train your heart? You can't lift weights. You can't take your heart to spiritual gym. You can make your heart stronger, beating stronger so you don't get heart attack, yes. But how do you train your heart, your soul? So the whole part of me going about this is from my own experience with anger. Now, those who know me will know that I have an anger problem. I have a temper problem and many men do. It's bleed into our testosterone, our XY genes. And Paul says, in your anger, do not sin. Not that never get angry, but in your anger, do not sin. So there's a difference between anger and the next step. And I said it before, nobody ever loses their temper. When I lose my temper, it's because I decide to. We don't lose our temper like, Oops, oh yeah, I dropped my key somewhere. Oh, it just happened to me. Lah. We choose to throw our temper. Now, let me demonstrate something from this show. The second film, uh, sorry. Uh, yes, it's actually from the second film, the Shark series. Just to summarize, this princess chose to, uh, true love. And because of that, she's transformed into true love's form, which is Shrek, the ugly ogre she fell in love with. So from a beautiful princess, she became an ogre. And in the second film, she takes Shrek, her husband, to meet her human family. Of course, it doesn't turn out well. Culture clash. And so after that, they have an argument. And take a look at this. Very nice, Shrek. What? I told you coming here was a bad idea. You could have at least tried to get along with my father. You know, somehow, I don't think I was going to get Daddy's blessing, even if I did want it. Well, do you think it might be nice if somebody asked me what I wanted? Sure. Do you want me to pat for you? You're unbelievable. You're behaving like a... Go on. Say it. Like an ogre. Well, here's a news flash for you. Whether your parents like it or not, I am an ogre! <laughs> so he had an argument and the princess Fiona called him an ogre. But do you notice something? Let's play again and stop at this certain point. You're unbelievable! You're behaving like a... <sighs> you notice that? Before she said it, she caught herself and realized what she's about to say. That is the moment when anger, you can control it or turn it to sin. But in this case, Shrek takes her on. Shrek provokes her. Feel good to win the argument. Go on, say it. Like an ogre. Well, here's a news flash for you. Whether your parents like it or not, I am an ogre. And that's when you troll. 
your temper. That's when you choose to let go of your anger and it from, turns from anger to sin. It feels good to say something clever, to win an argument, to make the other person feel bad and yourself feel good. So what does it have to do with training up like an athlete? Imagine that every car has a heat gauge, right? So imagine your car can only take a few, a few units of heat before it overheats. How to drive a car like this? You drive to work one time, overheat already. What you need is to increase how much heat capacity the car can take, the radiator can cool off before it overheats. Unfortunately, as people, as humans, you can't just add more parts. You can't just swap out for a bigger radiator. Instead, like this uh, legend of the two wolves, young Red Indian boy, Cherokee boy, went to his grandfather and asked uh, for advice. And the grandfather told him, in each person, there are two wolves fighting. One is evil, uh, wicked, destructive, anger. The other is good and kindness. They're fighting all the time. And the boy asked, Who, which wolf will win? The one you feed. That's what the Bible says, isn't it? How does sin come about? It's not like, Tap! Oh, I lost my control and became sin. No. Which, when each person is tempted and lured by enticed by his desire, then it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Little by little, but in the other way. Habits grow like dragons. You feed them. Which wolf will win? The one you feed. So every time you come across a choice, when you get annoyed, when you get angry, which wolf do you feed? The one that is patient, humble, okay, I won't say anything, I let him win. Or the one that... Bah, 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 bah. Which do you feed? The more you feed it, the more it grows. If you choose the way of self-control, the radiator will increase in size. That moment, like Fiona, when she realized, I'm about to say something bad, I'm about to lose my temper, that moment increases. Just like exercise, the first time you cannot do 10 push-ups, start with one. After a while, you suddenly, if you realize, oh, now I can do 10, now I can do 20. Maybe at the start, when it comes to temper, lust, seeing wrong taste, anything, laziness. At the start, you fall into it. Aya, I lost my temper. Uh, somebody says something, you straight away you get angry. You're used to it. You see something wrong when scrolling internet, straight away you look at it. You're used to it. Make a decision. One small habit at a time. One small decision at a time. Over time, you start to notice the, the radiator time, the amount of space of time you have to realize I'm about to do something wrong, increases. Work at it. We take every thought captive for Christ. Thought by thought. There's no instant solution. Our sanctification is gradual, day by day. God wants us to keep His commandments. And they aren't burdensome. It's not too hard for us. It's not impossible to become the kind of sanctified person that you want to be, that Christ wants you to be. Because every time, every time you come across temptation, there is a way out. We can never blame God and say, God, basically you made me do this by putting me in this situation. You let all the things happen in this way. Takdil, isn't it? You always have a choice. When we sin, it's our choice. When I throw my temper, it was my decision too. I didn't lose it. You didn't take it from me and make me angry. So like James Clear says, habits are atomic. It's just a little bit. You can't control the way you were born. You can't control your environment most of the time. And you can't control luck, things that happen to you. What seems like luck? Takdir. But you can control your habits. So just a very short one. Your outcomes in life are often a lagging measure of your habits. You know, like a lot of the time people talk about, you know, I want to have more money or I want to lose weight or I want some kind of result. But the truth is your bank account is a lagging measure of your financial habits. Your weight is a lagging measure of your eating habits. Your knowledge is a lagging measure of your learning and reading habits. And so it's actually 
we think the thing that needs to change is the bank account or the test score or the number on the scale, but actually the thing that needs to change are the habits that precede those outcomes. Every action you take is kind of like a vote for the type of person you want to become. And if you can master the right actions, if you can master the right habits, then you can start to cast votes for this new identity, this desired person that you want to be. And um, I think that's one of the reasons why small habits matter so much. They don't necessarily transform your life overnight, right, right away. Like doing one push-up does not transform your body. But it does cast a vote for being the type of person who doesn't miss workouts. Or meditating for one minute might not give you an immediate sense of calm in your life. But it does cast a vote for being a meditator. One push-up doesn't make you an athlete. But it casts a vote every time you have a choice to make. Are you going to be lazy? Or are you going to work hard? Next day, again, a choice. A choice, a choice. Are you going to lose your temper? Are you going to give in to lust, selfishness, laziness? A choice, a choice, a choice. And these choices gradually build up to refine us to be the kind of vessels that are useful to God's work. So as I said, you can't even run a marathon. You don't even first take the first step. So let me encourage you to take that first step. Or if you're already taking those steps, keep at it. Train up. I'm not talking about your physical, although you help lah. I'm mainly talking about your spiritual. The choices you make, it will get easier. Let me promise you this. Because God is there to help us. The first push-up is the hardest. It will get easier. And we have that to look forward to. Because it's through all these sufferings. Your habits are not, your, your choices, your atomic habits are not going to make you happy right away. It's in the long run. It's in that eternal, eternity rope. So even though we go through hardships, we don't know what the seafood is doing up there in the sky, we never lose hope. We're not in despair, crushed, abandoned, or destroyed. So we don't give up. You may fall down, you may get tired, and be honest, you will fail. I will fail many times more. Get up and get back to it. Because you're being renewed day by day. With ever increasing glory, little by little, day by day. Shall we pray? Lord, this life is not a cakewalk. We're not on a cruise ship. We are workers on the battleship. We have jobs to do. Help us not to take life easy and forget that we have a real life to come. We have this life on earth to be refined, to be ready, to be good stewards, to be useful vessels for your kingdom. You have called us to be holy. You have called us to service as a response to what you have done for us. Not to earn our way to heaven, Lord, but to show thankfulness and because we want to, want to give you back the kindness you showed us by being kind to others, by serving you, by being more of the people who are lovable, Lord. We thank you because you loved us when we were so unlovely. Help us not to remain that way, to become more and more like you, so we can be worthy members of your family. Help us each and every day to make those little choices, little by little, so that we can make the bigger choices as they come. We commit these things to you, Lord, and we know that we believe in you a loving Father who cares for us, helps us along the way, who doesn't throw us to fate, but has promised all good things are working for us because we love you and we call according to your purpose. So give thanks to you, Lord. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.